There is absolutely nothing like winning a championship. If you play sports, that's what you're playing for. The best experiences of your life are where you're part of something that's bigger than yourself. If you could put 150 guys in the same room with the same mentality, with the same goals, and it just clicked, that's what we were in 97. 97, it means a lot, especially when you factor in the other championships that we won here at Nebraska. We knew what it took to be there in the end. For 22 years, he labored and waited. Tom Osborne finally has his national championship. Go ahead, crack a smile. You have won a second straight national championship. 25 straight wins for the Cornhuskers. I think 97 is kind of like the forgotten team. 94 it probably has a little bit more of a uh, heartfelt because that's the first one that Coach Osborne was able to break through. 95 is probably in a section of its own. He's gonna go! Holy cow! Touchdown, Tommy Frazier! We were all spoiled. When you haven't lost a game in like two or three years, yeah, you, you get to be uh, sort of entitled. The Huskers' second consecutive national championship in 1995 punctuated a 25-game win streak and closed the careers of two legendary Nebraska quarterbacks, Tommy Frazier and Brooke Behringer. The journey of the Cornhuskers' next starting signal caller would cover both a geographic and emotional distance. Everything about Scott Frost and his background would have suggested he would have ended up at the University of Nebraska coming right out of high school in Little Wood River, Nebraska. Wood River's a spot on the map. I transferred there before my freshman year. I went all through high school there. It's pretty rare to have a good athlete uh, and then to have one of Scott's caliber. That's a once in 50 years kind of thing. He was incredible to cover in high school. When you watch warm-ups, you're like, now how's this going to work? I mean, look at it. He was a freak in high school. I mean, just something the likes of which we had never seen. I threw the shot put against the guy, which is ridiculous that he was a 110-meter hurdle champion and also state champion in the shot put. Dad played here. His senior year was 1969. Tom Osborne was his position coach. Mom was an Olympic track and field athlete through the discus in the 68 games in Mexico City. Became the head women's track coach here and was here for three years. She also was a football coach. And Scott's high school team, you know, Larry Frost was the head coach, but Carol Frost was the one who was out there coaching the receivers. Carol was the track coach here. I'd come over and there would be these two little toe-headed boys running around as she was directing track practice. It was a real family affair with Larry and Carol and Steve and Scott. By 1993, Scott Frost had narrowed his choices down to either the power of the Husker offense or Bill Walsh and Stanford's West Coast attack. We recruited Scott probably as hard as anybody we've ever recruited anybody. He had size, he had speed, he had athleticism, and um, I guess he probably that year was our number one target in recruiting. Both schools offered many positive reasons for my con for um, continuing both my education and football career. Um, I have decided to sign a letter of intent with Stanford University. Sometimes you have a tendency to think the grass might be greener somewhere else. I also might maybe thought that Coach Walsh's offense was the right offense to try to get me to the next level and have an opportunity to play on Sundays. Nebraska football fans are so devoted, and they certainly were upset when Scott left. I think there was a, a real sense of, of betrayal. Look at this! He could go! In January 1995, after playing on both sides of the ball in two seasons at Stanford, Scott Frost began to entertain thoughts of returning to his native Nebraska. Scott called me and said, hey, I, I want to come home. What do you think? So I went in and I said, hey, coach, you know, I talked to Scott on the phone and he wants to come home. I suggested at that time that he maybe stay and wait through the spring to see how that went. And he said, no, he said, I'm coming back now. 
Unfortunately, when Scott got to Lincoln, everything was so rushed, he hasn't even had a chance to get a winter coat. And so the first image that many of his future teammates get of him is Scott Frost, this golden-haired boy coming from California wearing his Stanford Cardinal Letterman's jacket. It did not go over well with his team at all. I think there were some people that were naturally not going to like me because I left Nebraska and went somewhere else. The team had just won a national championship in 1994. I was the outsider and the new guy coming back, and there were some hard times. We tried to make him quit. Even though he was homegrown in Nebraska, he was an outsider into this program. He was a scout team quarterback, and we treated him as such, and uh, not necessarily trying to make him quit, but weren't pulling any punches either. When he came back, he didn't have it any different than any person that was on scout team. I was on scout team for two years, and you know what? I got my butt kicked for two years. I mean, there were times when Scott would take his helmet off, he'd throw it on the ground, and he was frustrated. And we'd go back to the huddle, and we'd say, that's it, he's not coming back tomorrow. And every day, he'd come back. And he'd just keep coming back and coming back until one day, the season's over, and it's like, you're one of us. You've earned it. Frost earned the starting job in 1996, cruising to a debut win over Michigan State. Two weeks later, a six-fumble, three-safety effort in a shutout loss in Tempe put the Husker offense under the microscope. The Arizona State game was shocked to everybody. It was an ambush, and Nebraska wasn't ready. Arizona State was a good football team, and we just ran into a buzzsaw that night. We didn't play very well offensively. It was a feeling that we never, ever wanted to ever feel again. To get beat 19 to nothing, that's an embarrassment. And so we knew we had to come back and give it 180% because 150% wasn't good enough. Nebraska's 26-game winning streak was history, but the Oscars rebounded to reel off nine straight wins. A victory in the inaugural Big 12 championship game against a four-loss Texas team would keep Nebraska's hopes for a third straight national title alive. You hate to have excuses, but uh, we had a good percentage of our team were sick with the flu. Number 58. On a roll. Gonna throw it. Got it. If I make a better read on uh, James Brown, I don't take the dive back. They don't make it on fourth down. You know, I'm not going to blame anybody. People made stupid mistakes. People got sick. Those things happen. You still got to find a way to win the game. Frost has a lot of running room. We did go down and play a good New Virginia Tech team in the Orange Bowl, and we were able to win that. So 11-2, and two, in most cases, would be a good year. But after what we'd experienced, there was a little bit of a drop-off. Around here, after two undefeated seasons, that was looked on as a failure. And, and quite frankly, as a team, we looked at it as a failure. The failures of the 1996 team would cause two defensive linchpins to reconsider their professional aspirations. Coach Osborne goes, uh, I feel pretty comfortable in saying that, um, you know, pretty much everybody agrees that you guys will both be first rounders. I think it was, you know, unconsciously a package deal where, you know, if I was going to stay, he was probably going to stay. If he was going to leave, I was probably going to leave. Grant and I, we, we went home. It literally took us, you know, a minute. We were like, there's no way we're leaving this program. We'd let ourselves down, our coaches down, the university down, the state down, fans around the world down. And so having a chance to come back and redeem ourselves was a great opportunity. We ultimately, we went in to see Coach Osborne and we said, Coach, we said, we're coming back to win them all. And that was it. I mean, how powerful a force were they? Maybe the best way to put it was they made Tom extend his career another year. Tom had made a promise years earlier to Frank Solich that he would coach five more years and that he would be done. And 96 was supposed to be the last of those seasons. I told Frank that uh, I would, uh, would honor that commitment and, and, and leave it in five, but I'd really like to come back for one more year since they were. Frank agreed. We felt like if we're coming back, player senior years, then if something goes wrong, then it's going to be on our shoulders. If I'm in there putting in my time and busting my ass, rest assured you're going to be doing the same. 
I'm not going to lose a football game because you want to sleep in in July. That's not going to happen. First and ten. And the handoff to Makovica breaks tackles inside the ten. He's down to the five. Four yards. Still on his feet. He's in. I would get it, you know, eight or nine times a game, so I knew I had to make the most of it. It's kind of madness right there. I think everybody was almost in shock that he had scored. They're trying to arm tackle this kid. He's a 235-pound, bull-strong fullback, and he just ran right through him. If you want to know who our football team was, turn that run on, and then you'll know who Nebraska was from 93 to 97. After steamrolling Akron to open the 1997 season, a game against quarterback Dante Culpepper and Central Florida a team entering only its second season playing major college football became an unexpected September crossroads for the Cornhuskers. Tom had decided that Frankie London, the backup quarterback, was going to get a series in, uh, in the second quarter. Tom Osborne made it very clear to the media and hopefully the public yesterday that we, the fans would see Frankie London in, in the second quarter, prearranged no matter how Scott Frost was doing. And he said, don't anybody read anything into that. He'd just like to do that even with Frazier and Behringer. Nobody realized that that series would come up at a time when Nebraska was trailing in the game. Frankie took us right down the field. We scored. So I put Scott back in. And then there were some people that, for whatever reason, and, and it wasn't overwhelming, but there were a few boos, and I was upset about it. That's maybe the first time I've ever heard anybody boo in this stadium. When it happened, I thought about it. You know, hey, wait, now, this isn't Nebraska. The fans were tough on Scott. The fans still to this day can be tough on Scott because he went to Stanford. Two third quarter Correll Buckhalter touchdowns and a late score from Scott Frost propelled Nebraska to a 14 point victory. But the Oscar fans treatment of the struggling offense continued to resonate. Scott was very emotional after the game. It would take an awful long time for him to get over his feelings he felt towards the fans and how he'd been treated that day. I don't think that that has any place in this stadium to boo a player that's playing well. If it bothered him, it was more on the inside, because on the outside, you really didn't see that phase him a whole lot. Students might have a tendency to have a little more fun before the games or something. I don't know. <laughs> so maybe that's the reason. The incident served as the undertone as Nebraska traveled to the shores of Union Bay for the marquee matchup of the young season at second-ranked Washington. Washington was my first road game as a Husker, and so we're flying out to Seattle, and I was just asking him about the experience of going on the road. He looked over at Chad Kelsey, who was our starting defensive end, and he asked him, do you think we'll win this game? And Chad Kelsey looked over at him, grabbed him, and put him up against the, the window in the airplane. He literally grabbed me by the shirt and kind of put me in my seat and said, don't ever say that. We're going to win them all. What a great moment for an upperclassman to teach a little freshman that, you know, there's never any doubt. Like, this is, this is our mindset. The expectation is we're going to step on the field and we're going to win. And we're going to do it in a way that's going to be physical and, and dominating. The Washington game, that's why you come to Nebraska. They had their own golden boy at quarterback. All we heard all week was this Brock Heward. Brock Heward. Oh, Brock Heward. We went in there and we said, we're going to dominate them at their home, in their house, and we're going to make their house our house. We'd been one and two and three for so long, for those so many years, that uh, seven felt like, man, we're not rated very high and we're a little disrespected. I remember being on the sidelines with, though, before the game, and I walked up to Scott and I said, you have to be the guy that drives this thing. Here's the option by Scott Frost, breaks a tackle, 30, 25, 20, 15, 10, 5, he's gonna score! I certainly wasn't the best player, but I was pretty big and strong for a quarterback, and, and that kind of play fit me well. He literally broke free in that game of a lot of things. As he was running down the field, you could see all those things flying off his back. He became a new guy. Frost keeps it, takes off. He's gone again. Touchdown. Scott Frost was booed in Lincoln, but today it's... Uh... It's the Scott Frost Show. 
outside of the state of Nebraska, I think there was still a lot of respect for us and our program, and it kind of gave me some confidence going into the game, and we showed up and played well that day. Frost was just part of the show as Nebraska's black shirts ended Brock Heward's afternoon prematurely. If you're the quarterback and I'm coming after you, I'm not thinking about taking you down safely. I'm thinking about getting you on the ground. Brock says I went low on him, whatever. By the end of it, I realized that it's as fun going on the road and winning sometimes and watching a stadium go silent than it is even playing at home. The Huskers landed in familiar territory after the road win, ranked third in the AP poll. And as they punished Big 12 opponents on both sides of the ball throughout October, they would rise again to number one. If people knew all the stories of what it was like to play here, they'd be shocked. But you couldn't survive at Nebraska unless you were tough. We had talented players, but more than that, we had tough players. And that's what really what Nebraska football was about, was being tougher than the opponent. Outland Trophy winner Aaron Taylor anchored the offensive line, returning to guard after an All-American junior season at center. Aaron's a special guy. He is a true leader. He leads naturally. We call him the godfather even to this day. Aaron was a special kind of football player. He had, he had some grit. He played angry. He would get under you, and he was trying to pancake you on every block. We considered ourselves to have six starters. We have Josh Eskew that's a little more on the rambunctious side. Matt Hoskinson's the prankster. The stuff we can't even say on TV that he would do in the locker room. We had Eric Anderson, who was by far one of the best tackles at that time in college football. We called him the silent assassin because he was so quiet, but yet he would absolutely destroy defensive ends on the field. And John Zadishka, he's Nebraska born and bred, and he looks like Adonis. Freddie from Creighton Prep was extremely strong, extremely fast. Probably the best athlete we had. Fullback Joel Makavica paved the way for Amon Green who scampered for nearly 1,900 rushing yards and 22 touchdowns during the regular season. Sometimes I wouldn't get touched until I got to the secondary. That was going to be a win for me because I was bigger than most free safeties and strong safeties. The handoff to Amon Green. Right Amon was one of those guys where Amon could make one step and go. Here's a handoff to Amon Green, sweeping the right side, across the 45, 50, he bounces free, he's down the far sideline, 30, 20, 10, 5, touchdown Amon Green! I don't think I had been involved with anybody that could come through a hole faster and with as much power as Amon Green. We averaged almost 8 yards a carry in 1997, that's crazy. Frost became the first Nebraska quarterback to both rush and pass for 1,000 yards in the same season. He always ran hard. I mean, he, he was, almost ran as hard where you're worried about him sometimes. He would take the hit underneath the chin and have to get stitches, you know, during the game and then come back out and continue to play. He's the toughest quarterback that I've ever played with. He's one of the smartest quarterbacks that I ever played with. Seniors Jason Peter and Lombardi Award winner Grant Wistrom combined for 15 and a half sacks and 32 tackles for a loss as the Huskers finished fifth in the nation in total defense. I'm a Wistrom, I'm a Husker, and I'm a black shirt. I put my teammates above myself. I play for my teammates. He made himself faster. He was a guy that wasn't a four or five guy, but his ability and his relentlessness playing was amazing. Pitches the ball back on a misdirection play, and he is hit back behind the line by Jason Peter for a big time loss. He was the party starter. You know, when you look back in the first quarters, he was the one that was gonna get that big tackle for loss, big sack, big hit on the quarterback. For him to follow his brother out there from New Jersey, and you know, Christian made such a name for himself, and then, when Jason really stepped out from his shadow, I, I think that was a big deal for him. 15 of the top 18 tacklers went into the NFL, which is astounding when you think about it. Grant and Jason obviously were great players, but Mike Brown, as the safety, he was an incredible force. As the calendar turned to November, a meeting with a longtime rival produced a milestone win for Tom Osborne. 
When I grew up, that was the game. That was the national game. There was really no other game like it. Unfortunately for us, when we got there, Oklahoma was on kind of a downslide. Let's see what Scott Frost does. Hands it straight ahead to Makovic at 30, 25, 20, 10, 5. He's going to score! It was clicking that day, and there were just big holes, and I think he scored three times that day. And that's probably going to take care of business here. Tom Osborne has won his 250th career victory at Nebraska as head coach. On behalf of the Nebraska football teams over the past 25 years, and the 1997 Nebraska football team, we'd like to thank you and congratulate you on your 250th victory over 25 years. some great achievement at 250 wins, but why was such a big deal made of it? We thought he'd hit 350. There were some guys that were questioning whether that would be his last year. The big red machine, and until proven otherwise, this, in my opinion, is clearly, clearly the number one team in the nation. I've never heard so many people talk about a football game that they almost won in my entire life. It was just another football game on the schedule for us. Missouri ran a similar style of offense that we did. So you knew it was going to be a grinded out kind of game just by the way they played and their style of offense and, and ours. Six points! Corby Jones, that was probably his best game of his career. You know, offensive line gave us some problems. Corby, gonna show option and pull back from it. He's got a man wide open. Touchdown! For a while around here, it was almost like the defense picked on us and, and they were the leaders of the team and we were holding them back. And in that particular game, in that particular night, the offense had to step up and help the defense. There's a handoff straight ahead to Amon Green. He goes in standing up for the touchdown. After every series, after we would score, we'll come to the sidelines before the defense run on the field. Hey, just hold them. We're going to keep scoring. They can't stop us. Not to take anything away from the quarterback. He was a good player, but it was unfortunately our really poor, poor performance on defense. Play fake. Corby rolls right. Got all kinds of time back. Wide open to Lebo. Ten yard line. Touchdown. Missouri. Mizzou leads it. Without those back shirts, we don't win championships. And so as an offense, we looked at it and said, this is a challenge. Let's go. A pass over the middle, and Newcomb, has he got it? Yes! He held on! To Amon Green, he's to the 50, 45, 40. He's to the 35, 30, 25, 20. Far sideline. Scott Frost puts it in for the third time today. Nebraska regains the lead. Then the sun set, and it got colder. The game got hotter, and everything was just ramped up. Every possession, every play. Out on Rucker, dives for the end zone. Goes airborne, Corby Jones, touchdown over the top. We couldn't stop the guy. He just didn't make mistakes. On a fake, Corby Jones goes hard. And then wide right open, the touchdown. Missouri leads it. 439, Eddie Brooks all alone in the end zone. That whole situation to me felt surreal. You got to remember when Nebraska would lose back then, it was monumental. I mean, I, I hate to say the end of the world, but it sort of felt like that here. Crowd's going crazy, and Coach Osborne just looks at us all and says, listen, we're going to go down the field, we're going to run 32, 38 option pass. Lineman, get your box. Scott, make a good throw. Receivers, catch the ball and get out of bounds. We'll be just fine. Let's go. Cross rolls hard to the right, uses the sideline. And that really got the drive going. And we're able to kind of pick our way down the field. Cuts the arm, fires a pass, and a catch made down at the 27-yard line by Matt Davison. We were known as a run team, but I'll tell you what, we could pass block just as well as anybody could, I felt like. Cheatham. 
Got him out of bounds. Now they're going to keep him on and find it. During that no huddle going down the field, it seemed like that took hours. And it was just boom. I give Coach Osborne a little bit of grief because it's the only time I ever really saw him nervous. Coach wanted to run uh, an option play. Coach Gill and I actually convinced him that if we threw a pass to the end zone, we'd have enough time to have that pass be incomplete and still run whatever we needed to on the next play. Finally, we got to the play that everybody remembers. 99 double slant, which was a play that we hadn't run all season long. They'll go to the shotgun formation. The snap back to Scott Frost. He looks. With the protection 99, he's looking to the left first. If it's not there, he comes back to the right and throws it to Shevin Wiggins. Frost to the middle. Shevin cradles it against his chest right at the goal line. As he's about to cross the goal line, he gets hit from behind by a Missouri defender. It wasn't like a clear-cut drop, but it was a ball that he certainly could have held on to also. But thank heavens, he at least kicked it. You're seeing all this develop, and then you're seeing the kick, and you're seeing the ball just rotate. And everything's just happening so fast, but yet slow at the same time. The ball comes down, and I'm waiting for the referees to go incomplete. Everything was still slow motion, and then as soon as Matt Davidson caught that ball and goes up, it went into fast forward. the Nebraska sideline celebrating. They're jumping up and down, throwing their helmets, going nuts. I'm going, what in the hell just happened? The snap back to Scott Frost. He looks, drives a pass into the end zone, incomplete. Touchdown. Hey. Yes, he caught the ball for the touchdown. Holy cow, Matt Davison. I was just kind of running towards the action. My momentum just kept me going across the back of the end zone, and I just saw the ball come out of the pile of people, and it's just kind of floating, you know, end over end. So at that point, it's just instinct. I was able to get my hands underneath of it, and, and luckily the officials saw it correctly because it was close to the ground, no replay back then. They're running off the field, and I asked, what just happened? He says, I don't know, but they gave us a touchdown. We never practiced kicking it, obviously. That was the first time I had ever seen that happen. There were a couple games previous in my career where I thought, well, we had a little bad luck. And I guess it all evened out right there. It was mayhem. Their fans were coming out of the end zone, jumping on the field goal post. We score the touchdown, we got to kick the extra point. So I'll get out to my spot, and the officials were getting people off the field. And the goal post is literally like moving. And so I just took a deep breath and focused on my target. Everybody that was on that offense knew that the game was over because we knew our defense was going to step up. All we had to do was score. Here's the option by Scott Frost. He'll run the football, following blockers. He's to the five, and he yes. dives in for the touchdown. I remember the defense. They came up to us before the drive even started and said, if you guys score, I can guarantee you they're not going to score. Just go get the touchdown, and let's end this thing. I want to do whatever I had to do to win that football game and just couldn't wait to step back out there. Whatever happened up to this point doesn't matter. This is a new game right now, and let's go out and let's just shut these guys down because they don't belong on this field with us. Coach McBride tried to talk to us. We were like, dude, get out of here. We got this. Osborne in the corner. Let's go. Play away from the win. Jones under pressure. It's over. Nebraska wins it in overtime. A miracle finish. What better way than Mike Rucker from Missouri and Grant Winstrom from Missouri, both making a sack to end the game. Every Nebraska fan ever will always remember that game and that play because it literally saved their national championship. That's not the way we wanted to do it, but we got it done. That's all I have to say. I think that game changed a lot of things. It certainly was rewarding to be able to finish the season the way we did. And without that game with Missouri and the finish, none of that would have happened. At the time, we didn't know what was going to happen. In a month or so, this legendary coach was going to walk away. If you believe in football gods, the football gods gave him one. The football gods knew he was leaving, and they threw him one. There you go. I had to do all the interviews and everything, so I'm the last one, I think, on the bus. And Coach Osborne was sitting there in his front right seat, as he always does. And so as I walked on, I mean, I'm thinking, you know, if there's ever a time, 
you know, that the legend might give you some love. You know, it's now. He was sitting there in his seat, and I walked past, and he said, nice catch, Matt. <laughs> <laughs> that was it. The Missouri game put them behind the eight ball because they're still undefeated, right? But people looked at them like they had a loss. Nebraska paid for the Missouri game. They dropped behind Michigan. Coach Osborne and the rest of the staff did a good job of keeping us focused on what was important, and that was just handling the task in front of us every week. But you can't help but look at the polls and see where you're sitting. Nebraska dominated their next seven quarters of football, hanging 77 points on Iowa State and sprinting to a 17-point lead at Colorado before disaster nearly struck late in Boulder. I think there was some letdown from us just because it was 27 to 10 and then you have a turnover and then you have an onside kick and the team's right back in it. And our defense has to make a stop for us to get to the national championship game. Colorado fourth and 25 from their 21. John Hessler takes the snap, retreats, looking, rifles a pass up the field and a catch by Savoy, tries to stiff arm his way and fights to get out of bounds. He didn't get the first down. The Huskers will take over the football. We start maybe to press a little bit. It was one of those plays like, you know, hey, look, we got to get out of here. Returning to the Big 12 title game for the second straight season, Scott Frost aimed to tame the Aggies while Jason Peter fought through back spasms. We kind of knew that there was a chance that this thing would probably lock back up again. So kind of thought if I'm going and let's hit the ground running and Jason Peter bad back and all storms in for the first sack of the game they had a lot of talent on that team and a lot of people that we kind of got tired of hearing about and we were looking forward to going down and playing against and beating up on we weren't going to have a, a Texas mistake from the year before the ball is at the Aggies 31 yard line and around Newcomb cutting back to the left he's got an alley frost throws a beautiful block for us to see our quarterback throw a shot like that, man, it throws into a frenzy. There's no reason for a quarterback to go out and make a block like what Scott Frost did in that A&M game. And he did it all the time, and we would laugh at him, going, what is he doing? To play on our team in 97, you had to be physical. That went from the nose guard all the way to the kicker and the quarterback. My teammates would have been all over me if I hadn't done it. Our offense was rolling and our defense played well and it was over at halftime. Frost and Amon Green combined for 258 yards and five touchdowns on the ground, powering Nebraska to an historic victory. When the Cornhuskers returned to Lincoln to begin preparations to battle Peyton Manning and Tennessee in the Orange Bowl, the secret Tom Osborne guarded for the entire season was finally revealed. That was toward the end of the year. I was having some troubles with my body, and <laughs> so I went in and started talking to him about maybe I should pull the plug. And he kind of looked at me and said, well, you know, I I'm going to retire. I felt that if I was going to leave, this was the best possible way I could leave because it wasn't going to be disruptive to the players or the or the coaches or to the state of Nebraska. Essentially, uh, you know, at this time, obviously, I'm I'm going to step aside after the bowl game. I want to make that very clear that it's got to be after January 2nd. The emotions, uh, shock. I mean, I'm still the little kid with the, the little plastic Husker helmet on running around, and Coach Osborne was still such a icon to me, even having played for him. I'm in reasonably good shape. I mean, I have no uh, major problems where I'm going to keel over right here in front of you or anything like that. The question is, well, when is the right time? And uh, I feel that, uh, that this is the, the time that that has to, to happen. It was an emotional period for a lot of guys because of what he meant to the program. Sitting back there when Coach Osborne was saying that uh, he really didn't get a chance to see his kids grow up that much, I just wanted to say that, that he's had a chance to watch 150 guys on this team grow up and the thousands that came before us that he's coached grow up and, and he's been like a father figure to all of us. 
he's arguably the best coach in college football history, but the thing that he really does for his players is uh, he doesn't just teach us on the field, but you know, by his uh, example and the example he sets, uh, we don't just learn football around here, we learn how to be, uh, how to be grown-ups, how to mature, and how to become men. It's always hard to tell your players that, uh, that you're done. I guess the main reason I, I never left here was that I just couldn't figure out how I was going to tell players that I'd recruited and I had told this was a good place and this was the best place that then I was going to go leave because of whatever money or whatever it might be. So I, I, I really cared about those players and uh, really felt committed to them and uh, hated to leave them. Coach Osborne, for him to step aside, um, I wasn't ready for that. Even though, you know, my time there was pretty much done, I, I wasn't ready for that. I was ready to get back and go watch him a few, a few more years coaching. I don't know many men that are, are better people than him. He genuinely cared about every single one of us, knew us personally, would do anything for us, and because of that, we'd run through a wall for him. He's had the biggest impact on my life more than any human being that I've come across. He devoted so much to the university, so much time, and his family needed some of that time back, so we understood. On one end, you're sad, but on another end, we was like, yes. We got a chance to say that we would be the last team ever, the last senior class ever, uh, to play for the legend. From that moment on, Tennessee was beat. There was no way we were going to send somebody that was so influential in so many lives out on losing note, there was just no way. With no BCS or playoff in place at the time, 12-0 Nebraska prepared for two opponents, third-ranked Tennessee in the Orange Bowl and an undefeated and top-ranked Michigan team in the polls. My feeling was that we should play Michigan because we were both undefeated, but they had this contract with the Rose Bowl, and they weren't going to change it, so uh, it ended up with Michigan and Washington State and us in Tennessee. Coach Osborne told us before the game, all we can do is go out and win this game. You know, we can't control the polls. We can't control how people are going to vote. But what we can control is how we play, and that's how we prepared for a month. The players were just so motivated to do this for Tom. And the night before their game, they're all together, and they watch the Rose Bowl. And they see Michigan pull out this victory at the very end. Clock shows time has run out. Well, I look around the locker room, everybody's disappointed. I stood up. I said, guys, don't worry about that. We're going to play the way we've played all year tomorrow. And the way we play tomorrow is going to determine our future. Let me tell you about the pride factor in wearing this red jersey. Let me tell you something, seniors, in case you guys don't know, we have never lost while we're wearing these red jerseys. A lot of us are going to be wearing these jerseys for the last time, and there's one man who's going to remember this game for the rest of his life, and that's Coach Osborne. Let's take these next three hours, and let's dedicate it to one of the greatest football coaches, if not the greatest coach there ever was. As things have developed here, and I've thought about it, uh, the door isn't just a little bit open, the door is fairly wide open for you. It just depends on what you want to do with it. Day by day! Day by day! It's better and better! We get better and better! Team of KBB! Team of KBB! We just knew that they couldn't block us up front from the first play of the game. If you go back and look at that first series, the play that Jason made, you know, I was able to make a play on third down. Grant was able to get a hit on the quarterback. Our secondary played their asses off that game. You know, to be able to cover them up like that, and just when they did catch the ball to tackle them. The turning play in that game was, was when Ralph Brown forced a fumble. Bryson leading the way. Lewis hit hard and fumble. And Nebraska has recovered. That killed that drive. Momentum went back to us. Charlie McBride is doing this zone blitz thing that just confuses the heck out of Peyton Manning. Manning. That pass deflected and intercepted by Eric Warfield. Warfield. It was the pressure that was coming, and I, I read it perfectly, and I just see a wobbly ball coming my way and headed the other way. I just wish I had better return skills because I could have put it in the end zone. 
While the black shirts tormented Peyton Manning and the Volunteers, the Nebraska offense finally awakened after a slumbering start. They were stopping us behind the line of skirmish. One play, I remember he tackled me, and he's like, Amon, this is how we play football in the SEC. This is how we play defense. I'm like, okay, but this is the first quarter. They were physical and fast and packed up close to the line of scrimmage, and we had to take to the air. We completed a boot to Sheldon Jackson and a comeback on the sideline to Matt Davison and a belly option pass to Bobby Newcomb and got our first touchdown, and that really kind of opened everything up. Up and over and in for a touchdown. When did I know we had Tennessee? We put the ball in the end zone in the first quarter, and their All-American outside linebacker came up to me and said, man, you guys are good. Nebraska took a 14-3 lead into the locker room, where the Husker offensive line made a rare request of its head coach. Coach Tenniper would always ask us what we were seeing, and I said, Coach, they're tired, they're beat up, just run the ball straight at them. And he looked me dead in the eye, and he said, go tell the redhead. Under normal circumstances, I probably wouldn't do that, but literally this is going to be my last half of football. And so I grabbed Coach Osborne outside the locker room, and I just said, Coach, they're tired. They're beat up. We've got them right where we want them. And he looked me right back and he said, that's what I'm seeing too. He goes, we'll get it done. In the first half, those Tennessee guys were just talking, 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 talking. In the second half, they didn't say a word because we were just mowing them over. They were on the ground. It's one of those things where everything was hitting on all cylinders, and so it was a perfect audible. It was a perfect block. It was the best quarter of football we played in, in my five years in Nebraska. Heeding their offensive line's advice, the Cornhuskers ran the ball on 21 of 22 offensive plays in the third quarter, hammering Tennessee for 227 yards rushing and three touchdowns during those 15 minutes. He's to the 20, he's to the 15, 10, 5, look out, he's gone, touchdown! One of their players came over on the sideline and made a tackle. They were on defense. And he asked me to throw him the towel that was laying on the ground there. And he started waving it. <laughs> you know, we surrender. Hey, let's get out to these guys. That was ridiculous last time. Let's go! Green finished with an Orange Bowl record 206 yards rushing, earning MVP honors as the Huskers applied the final brush strokes to the canvas of Tom Osborne's final masterpiece. One thing that we really did develop there was just a finishing mentality and finishing teams off. When you got them down, step on their throat. This is the number three team in the country that we're playing. Uh, we wanted to bury them and make it not even close, so the people voting in the polls had something to really to think about. Jeff Lake goes wide to the left side. Here is a keep by Scott Frost, and he'll score another touchdown. There was a statement behind holding the one up. We felt like we were the best team in the country. I still feel like we were the best team in the country. I don't think anybody could have taken the field and beat us. I remember Grant and I thinking, like, oh, man, is he going to be mad at us? <laughs> do you think we're going to disappoint Coach if we do this? We were just like, no, we cannot win a national championship and not, you know, give them the Gatorade bath. I'm very proud of our team. I think we did all we could. We, uh, we won 13, and that's all we played. It wasn't Tom's way to campaign for a national championship, but this was one case where Scott wasn't going to necessarily follow what, what Coach had to say. Coach Osborne had told us before the game not to talk about that stuff too much, but we're all competitors, and I didn't want to let an opportunity go by if, if we had the type of game that I thought we would in the Orange Bowl. If, if all the pollsters honestly think, after watching the Rose Bowl and watching the Orange Bowl, that Michigan could beat Nebraska, go ahead and vote Michigan by all means.
I wanted to stay focused on the game, so my brother Steve, who's smarter than me, as I was preparing for the game, I asked him just to write some ideas on a piece of paper of what I should say if we won the game and won it handily. I don't think there's anybody out there that with a clear conscience can say that Nebraska, and especially Tom Osborne, that great man, doesn't deserve a national championship for this, at least a share. Our game wasn't even close, the Rose Bowl was. And Michigan had a great team and I think deserved a share of it too. But some things needed to be said to, to make sure that we had our best opportunity to send out Coach Osborne out as a champion. I just thought maybe people would favor Michigan. And I didn't know if Scott's plea would do it or not. I kind of hoped it was effective, but you didn't really know. Well, let's have wait, see what happens. I don't know that a uh, whole lot of talking now is going to do a lot of good. We did it out there. Let's just tell them, hey, let them vote. We'll see what happens. The undefeated Huskers return to their hotel, eagerly awaiting the results of the coaches poll. I'm going to say I didn't care if we won it because I knew we were the best team in the country, but that's something you have to say. But we wanted that trophy. There's no question about it. This just in. Nebraska champions in the ESPN USA Today coaches poll earlier this evening. Michigan winning the championship in the AP poll. But this is the coaches poll just released. Nebraska with 32 first place votes. Michigan finishes with 30. So 23 and a half first place votes shifted to Nebraska after the 25 point win here in the Orange Bowl. As much as I can say, we thought it was going to be a formality. Once you see it and you hear it and they make the announcement, then it's pure jubilation again. I don't think I saw anything over TV or anything. I think I just heard that noise and I figured that something had worked out. There's some people who said, well, Nebraska was for national champions because it was my last game. And maybe some people voted that way, but I think most coaches are pretty straight up and I think they probably voted their conscience. I hope they did right or wrong that was the way that that season shook out and there were two national champions and both teams deserved to go to the white house all of us were talking it's just like we gotta just line up and play on the lawn we're here let's go ahead and play a game we would have beat them there's no doubt about it we were so much faster than they were we'd put it to them we wanted to live up to his expectations send him out the right way so it was actually bigger than michigan it was more national championship and coach osmond it was a good way to go out. Usually when you leave coaching, things aren't always going that well. And so that was fortuitous. It just seemed that people were really on the same page and pulling in the right direction. So it was a good year to finish on. 97 was such a great redemption story. The best thing was being around a bunch of guys and having a common cause and a common purpose. A bunch of guys 100% committed to each other and to accomplish something great. Here is the pitch to Amon Green at the 15. He's to the 10. He's to the 5. Stumbles his way. Fumbles into the end zone. I took a dive and went over it. And then he comes in right behind me, scoops it up. Yeah, so he gets the glory. He actually knocked the wind out of himself because I think the ball was kind of in this area, maybe just stuck in his belly. He wanted to celebrate, but he couldn't breathe. And <laughs> so he was trying to gain his composure and, and breathe, and we're dragging him off the field. It's a great moment for us fat kids.